Hi everyone, during these particularly difficult times for me mentally and emotionally that I'm trying to cope with things in my life and find my bearings, I will make uploads, either audio or both audio-visual, even if it means I've only got eight views because it's something that I need to get out, release into the world, express myself and also you never know, it might be there might be one person even out there I might be able to help if they find my material by some chance and they're also going through a hard time in understanding and manoeuvring through whatever challenge that may be similar in some ways to mine they are going through. I would like to highlight and reinforce that it is not my intention to pick apart people who have gone through my life, their personality and their psychology because I want to judge them or because I want to hold them accountable. It is only because I am trying to understand what went down in order for me to be able to traverse through it. As I'm struggling at the moment, I was brought up in a very different way. I've mentioned in the past that I've heard psychologists say if a child is sheltered too much by the peers, by the family, the community, that's not a good thing. It's also as bad as being brought up by an uncaring environment. In my case, in our culture, people were very aware of dangers out there for children. I don't know. That's I don't know if it was like that in every household, but I do know that people from our own ethnic identity did worry about everything and anything in the world and had an opinion about it, a reaction to it and a lot of times uh, a solution or what they perceived as a solution for it. In other words, they didn't just bring it up and talk about it because they wanted to be smart Alex or because they wanted to be gossip artists. Surely it's part of human nature that we all gossip at some point. I don't know if it's because we find it interesting in creating intrigue, even when there is none. But my people would tackle an issue with the aim of trying to find some kind of resolution to it, trying to participate helpfully. I'm not painting my people as saintly or as heroic. We do have our fair share of errors and flaws. That's why I'm a firm believer of thinking, have, being self-aware and reflecting upon matters at hand, always engaging in positive self-development and in changing of societal standards where there needs to be alteration for an improvement and contributing into a fairer functioning human world because the only injustices I really am a firm believer of this that happen in this world is those created by humans animals are very innocent you've heard me say that before and I will scream it till I'm blue in the face they don't do anything by a motivation of malice or ill intent unlike us okay so mediterranean parents greek parents it became even an in-house joke among us greeks are very much warriors they worry about everything much to their own detriment which is not doing them any good to stress that much and also like i said they could be creating too much of a sheltered environment and conditions for the kids to be brought up in and what that means is that maybe they're not as equipped to deal with real problems in the real world which is very harsh out there in the long run I'm not sure but I do know that for example I will give you you know an indication uh, of what it's like growing up Greek my family was very much in the knowledge even in the 80s that there were a lot of dangers for young children to be with other adults because you don't know what those adults are capable of doing. So they didn't feel very comfortable at any point for me to sleep in other people's homes or to go camping. They wanted to have me in the safe environment of the family home, which I must admit, my home, I'm not trying to paint my my situation as the ideal one or my family as the the golden family 
but they were good people and they brought me up in a very loving way. And so whatever they could protect me from that was seen as potential hazard or danger, they would. I'm very grateful because what that means is that at least I didn't end up getting harmed in a sexual and physical way by any adults that I could have been if I spent time sleeping in friends' homes. I'm not saying my friends' parents were that way inclined, not at all, but you know what I'm getting at. I'm just clarifying that because I don't want anybody to jump to conclusions and what I'm insinuating about people I knew, people I went to school with and so on and so forth. Perhaps because my family brought me up in such a caring way and because I was used to a community, I perceived in a certain way that it cared for everyone else around us. Now I'm finding it such a struggle in a cold world that nobody cares about anybody else or at least they seem so distant and callous. Callous. Nobody's wearing any emotions on their sleeve. It's like they're ashamed of feelings. That's how it was being Greek. We were in everybody's business, even if we didn't know them. We cared about them. And I think I've explained in the past where my grandmother would see various things on television and she would burst into tears. She felt such compassion and empathy. Now, I'm not saying I learnt that compassion from them. What you feel cannot be taught or manufactured. Yes, indeed, environment plays a big role in how you, are, you turn out, but it's also genetically driven, or rather determined would be a more appropriate word. People might consider me naive that it's taken me this long at my ripe age to go through an existential crisis and to realise just how harsh the real world of humanity is. I think I always had it all, all along anyway. I met somebody i know yesterday on my way back home from some tasks that i needed to run some errands i needed to run for myself and we got talking and i you know he's a bit of a deep thinker from what i can tell as far as i knew him even many years back like 23 years ago when i first met him again i must correct myself 27 years actually and we got talking and i said to him that i'm struggling in this shallow kind of world to find some meaning which i'm really desperate in need for and he said to me that he's always wanted to find meaning too and he never found it in his relationships so it was good to hear that affirmation and you could see that i'm not, not because somebody else is experiencing a struggle like me not at all but because obviously somebody else can relate to some degree to me and you could see how his attitude instantly changed that he, he really became more involved than other conversations i've had with him in recent months when i'd run into him because obviously it was something that he identified he had in common with me and maybe he felt a little bit of a relief to come across an individual who has found such shallowness and lack of meaning in the world including in our relationships which brings me to why I'm struggling so hard to move on, not so much move on emotionally, but to accept and understand that there are people for whom relationships don't have to mean that much. I'm very much aware, and I'm capable of doing this, I think at least, maybe I wasn't earlier because I had to allocate meaning to everything in my life, everything had to have a purpose. But now, as I'm trying to mature mentally and emotionally and function outside the confines and safety of a long-term relationship. Because really, that's what I've known in my life until now, instead of fleeting, passing flings. As I'm maturing, I'm trying to understand that not everything is going to be about longevity. And you don't know anyway, as you enter a situation how long it would last despite me being used to the comfort zone of longer relationships i think i can now accept possibilities of shorter term turnouts just as a casual maybe dating however i went into this dating arrangement with this particular gentleman thinking that it was going to be something more relaxed or at least hoping for it and he kept pushing for something more serious even though he was giving me mixed signals and saying that emotionally maybe he was not so much available due to his past experiences 
Look, I'm a person who likes a good challenge anyway. I concluded, let's just go for it. I'm not one to shy away from challenges and difficult circumstances. Worst comes to worst, we could always back out if either one of us is not feeling comfortable with it. He seems to be fixed on what he wants, so why not? Unfortunately, that's not the way it panned out. Maybe I had tricked myself and talked myself into believing something optimum or at least positive could come out of it. It didn't. The signs were there. The biggest worry for me was the absence or what appeared as the absence of emotional investment from the other party. Now, there were always excuses and complaints that this guy kept expressing to justify his coolness. We were on and off and that's where the issues were forming and that's why the other person was reluctant in releasing himself, letting himself go emotionally. But I think that these things, whether you feel for someone or not, develop naturally, organically, and they can't be forced. Yes, you can have your guard up, but to a certain degree. I had mine up for quite a while, but at some point it came down because I really did start caring for this person. I was spending a large volume of days with what I considered were a lot of days back to back. Sometimes there'll be three, sometimes four, depending on circumstances. For the first five months of our relationship, there was a there were a couple of times, or maybe just even once, we spent five days in a row together. To me, it becomes inevitable that you will become emotionally involved and care for the other person. How could you not when you're spending every waking moment with them? I don't get it. This guy would dance between behavior. I'm not sure if he was even hot and cold. I don't know how to describe it, but he used the excuse that because I was uncertain and I would pull back at times of discomfort, yes, I noticed red flags and behavior on his part that was less than honest and quite troublesome. He would catch up with his exes at the slightest drop of a hat. There would be constant lookouts for new people to meet and add on his list and flirtations, checking out women, having dreams of women and even admitting as much to me. All this stuff made me feel very worried. He kept talking about his ex-girlfriends. He was emotionally absent or at least not available. Of course I was going to be worried and from time to time want to call it quits. But that's how he justified the fact that he wasn't getting emotionally connected to me. In addition, he wasn't able or seemed willing to participate in resolving issues between us. I know that a lot of us, when things get too much in life for us to deal with, we might set them aside for a while. That's not to say that we don't want to deal with them at all. It just gets too overwhelming all of a sudden, all at once. And we might want to time out some space for ourselves to bring ourselves to the stamina and ability to be able to deal with matters and resolve them if we can. But that's not what he was doing. He was just completely not being accountable and withdrawing. In an attempt to explain to me about what he was doing, he used the word compartmentalize. In other words, that he was putting things out of sight, out of mind, and that was his way of coping with stresses. In the last few days, I've been listening to a particular gentleman who is trying to help people recover from narcissistic abuse and narcissistic relationships. Interestingly enough, he uses the word compartmentalize in context of the narcissist. And anything they don't want to be accountable for, no matter how wrong it is, situations they don't want to deal with, cases that call for them to take a hard look at themselves and to have some feeling of guilt, responsibility, some answering for to do. So they will put it aside, compartmentalize it and not have to cope with it. I was confused the first time I heard the guy I had a relationship with use that term. I felt concerned because it was such a foreign word to me and I thought, well, I've never heard a non-professional, a person who's not a psychologist use that term. And I wondered instantly what it meant in a real life situation, in a relationship for your boyfriend to use that word. I know I'm a deep thinker and I overanalyze sometimes, but surely that should raise some kind of fear at least. What on earth does it mean? I know there are cognitive exercises professionals try to teach you in order to calm down a little bit if you're going through anxiety, how to set things aside and to stop it from escalating. 
I came across this in a course I did with a trainer and these techniques can be very good as coping mechanisms, creating new pathways in you dealing with stressful situations that normally will send you in overdrive and an overwhelming emotional and mental reaction. There are limitations though. These cognitive exercises I was introduced to work to a certain degree. When you're dealing with very severe, dire circumstances in your life, these tools become impossible or well, next to impossible to apply. When it comes to a really serious turn of events in your life, I do find these exercises a bit of a fuss and impossible to apply as helpful tools. For example, when you lose somebody you love, the end of a relationship, very severe and tragic situations. There is no quick fix to deep grief. In my opinion, as a receiver of certain services and guidances, there is a certain level professionals can help you at with this type of tools. After that is just going through the pains of all the feels slowly and bit by bit. In all my psychology expeditions though, I wasn't familiarized with the term compartmentalize as a means of helping you deal with things. I did a little bit of research and what that enlightened me on was that some people do apply compartmentalization as the method of coping with situations. Now, I don't know if it is professionally taught or if it's something they apply themselves automatically as a coping mechanism. You know, when they feel inundated or their personal, emotional, mental and physical safety threatened, hearing the narcissism speaker talk about it put a new light and a more positive confirmation to me that maybe indeed the guy I was in a relationship with was a narcissist, was somebody with NPD. I'm not sure the degree of training this self-confessed narcissist has had, but he runs courses to help people be educated and empower themselves. He explains that there are various levels you can measure how potentially harmful someone can be. This translates into apathy and in turn potential danger that they could pose for you depending on what criminality inclinations if any they have got. According to this professional he said the scale works as such. So we have on the one extreme psychopathy and they could have sadistic definitely inclinations they won't care, they're the most dangerous of them all. Then you get the next scale down, which is sociopath, and then you get the person with NPD. Also, you this gentleman was suggesting that there are, there are different ranges on the spectrum of narcissism, but I think what he meant is whether you get overt or covert, because a different professional that I heard speak was saying that there is no scale if you are a narcissist, you are there is no kind of range in between narcissistic traits are different though because you could have some of those it doesn't make you somebody with npd and a full-blown narcissist what you must remember is that dealing in a relationship with a narcissist will have you no matter how strong you are left with feelings of inadequacy you will keep questioning why you're not good enough for this person to fall in love with and even if you were to be a hundred percent flawless in your behavior which none of us can be or live up to because we're all flawed we're all human the problem is to be self-aware and to acknowledge it to try and improve on it but even if you were to be 100% flawless, these individuals will never be able to fall in love with you. They're incapable of, of emotional connection and feelings. A narcissist will go from relationship to relationship as quick as they can because they don't actually care about the relationship, they care about what it provides. So think of it this way, you go to a fast food restaurant and you're like, wow, this food sucks, so I'm not going to come here anymore. So you go to a next restaurant and you're like, this food sucks, so I'm not going to come here anymore. Okay, that's what a narcissist is doing to you. Okay, they're treating you as a convenience. So as a result, when you don't provide exactly what they want or when you stand up for yourself or when you don't continue on with the abuse, they're like, forget you, I'm going to go find someone else. We see this time and time again. If you've been discarded by a narcissist, if they've just moved on to the next person, it's not a bad thing. It feels like it because you're in love with someone who is giving you a fake version of themselves. But for you, it's an opportunity to heal. A good giveaway, according to this gentleman, that somebody is a narcissist, 
is that they can't be bothered listening to what you have to say. I'm not sure if it makes a difference between being covert or overt, if it plays a role in whether they tune in or not. And I think also whether you are at the initial stages of them trying to seduce you, because at the beginning they will try to portray a very good image of themselves, immaculate. They will become chameleons and shape themselves into what you need them to be so that they will lure you in. But the point is, they won't listen to you because they're so self-absorbed. Anything you have to say doesn't matter. They're too lazy to read your text. They can't be bothered. A woman I work with, I'm not sure if she was a full-blown narcissist or not, but she was a good indicator that she definitely had narcissistic traits because she would tune out when you would talk to her. She wouldn't listen to a thing you were saying or probability was that she would listen to the first few seconds and then after that you had lost her she would talk over you and completely change the subject anything that's not about them anything that doesn't focus on them doesn't center around them they're not interested in they are the beginning and end of all one time i remember she said to me that people who are late have got issues because they're too self-absorbed and because they don't care about anybody else that's why they're always running like this is nonsense and i know she was being passive aggressive although she was quite aggressive in her expression i know she was aiming it at me because i would often run late one or two minutes but i would stay back 40 to 50 minutes without getting paid to make up for it it wasn't that i was lazy the problem with me is i care too much about everyone and everything and what i think i can fit into my schedule I can't. I take up too many things. I take on too many projects to finish, too many tasks to complete in that day. And I say, oh, yes, I can do that. Oh, yes, I can do that too. And I think I can help everything and everyone except, of course, myself. The only thing is I'm always running behind time and it's not done intentionally. Even if I get up at 6 a.m. and I've got an appointment at 11, chances are that I will still be running a little bit late doesn't happen all the time but a lot of the time but fancy that lady thinking that she knew me when in fact she didn't and she was judging me that I was too self-absorbed and other people who've got too many things on their schedule every day are too self-absorbed she was projecting her own criteria onto other people and narcissists often will do that they will project from themselves onto other people what they're like they assume everybody else is like too but i was so upset to hear her express such hateful commentary because even though i've lost my faith in humanity and i know about the evil monster that dwells within humans i've become a bit of a misanthrope really i don't wish ill upon anyone though i care for others and i would never instantly insist and believe that people are running late because they are too self-absorbed there might be those who are inclined that way but not everybody is i haven't always known what narcissism is of course i've heard of the word and i'm in full knowledge of the greek mythology and narcissus the man who was in love with his own image it's only after the end of my last relationship that i started reading at such great depth what it's all about the implications that relationships with narcissists have on other people's lives and so on and so forth and since we were on the topic of compartmentalization please listen to this guy's video because if it's past your mind and you've wondered how on earth these people the narcissists are able to deal with themselves being so mean and the hurt that they have caused you the distress that they have caused you not only do they suffer from apathy but they think they haven't done anything wrong, no matter what they did was. How does a narcissist sleep at night knowing that they hurt other people? And the easiest way to be able to say it is in a narcissist's mind, they never hurt anybody. In a narcissist's mind is like, can't be their fault. Like, you're the one that caused it. Like, if you hadn't looked through my phone, then you wouldn't have known that I was cheating. So therefore, you're the one that actually hurt you. It wasn't the fact that I cheated. It's the fact that you invaded my privacy. Like, it has to go back to the other person. There's this aspect of, like, compartmentalization. I'm going to box up the things that I feel, the things that are going on, and I'm going to put that shit on you. I'm going to make sure that you feel like you're the bad person, not me. Because it can't be my fault. So at night, I have to be able to explain it away. Like, I have to explain a way of like, okay, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do this, X, Y, and Z. Now, it happens in different aspects and different lengths of time. It's not like every narcissist is like sitting down, right? Who did we hurt today? Let's go ahead and figure this out. Nope, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. They don't always do that, okay? But it does happen mentally. 
So please don't try to reason with the narcissist because no matter how much you are desperate to show them and make them realize what they're doing is wrong and how much they hurt you, not only do they not care, but in their eyes they can't do anything wrong. And it all makes sense now. It fits into place. What this guy is explaining and what my experience with a man I was seeing provided, it all matches up. Because when I was going through distress and I was pleading with him to see what he was doing to me mentally and emotionally from his shenanigans, he would turn it around and say, I didn't do anything wrong. You're bringing it on yourself. You're making yourself stress out. I'm not taking you to those places. You're in control of your mind and therefore your own predicament. He didn't take this approach only once or twice. There were many times throughout our relationship where I recall this kind of attitude. Now that is true gaslighting. And if you're wondering why this person doesn't miss you when you've broken up, doesn't he see how much or doesn't she see how much you love them and that the other people who were in their lives that were fleeting and offered them very shallow relationships, they're not after love. They do not evaluate you according to love. They don't have feelings. Love means nothing to them. What means something to them is what love can bring to them. So if you love them and that means you're going to share them with attention, physical gratification, admiration, validation, social status because you've climbed up the social ladder or because you're earning good money, you've got a good job and that will have a positive reflection on them because they're doing well and they're involved with a cool person in their life who is admired and that's all good to them only what you can benefit them with and what you can give them you're an extraction of different resources so it doesn't matter how much love you offer them only how much attention gifts and admiration you shower them with is of significance to them and if that means that you have to fall in love with them first in order to give them all those things then they will make damn sure that you do fall in love with them by being very nice to you by being sweet by conforming themselves shaping themselves into being your dream guy or girl you get the gist so no they're not going to compare how hot or kind or loving you were to them with everybody else they will meet in the future or people from the past who were lacking they might think back to you and consider measure what you had to give them versus everybody else but that's just about it everything has a monetary or benefit based value ruthless they sure are let me share a little anecdote with you not because i'm trying to run the guide to the ground but so you can understand how the mind of a narcissist works on one particular occasion my ex-boyfriend made reference to a guy we know from our social circles who was in financial dire straits and then he met this lady who was in a very good profession was making a good money and he now lives in a very nice home my boyfriend was commenting well, this guy's done well for himself. He's going places. He's climbed up the ladder. And I thought there were very strange things to utter because when I meet people, probably that is due to my stupidity, those things are not what I'm thinking of. I'm placing value on the character, on their integrity. And this is where I get sucked in because people can put on a mask, right? And this is where I went wrong with this guy as well. But fancy that. Fancy measuring somebody by what they have on offer like what these guys girlfriend had on offer correction wife i should say because they ended up getting married so imagine to my boyfriend what was important not even that she was attractive because she's a reasonably nice looking lady nothing else except that's what he had to comment on what she had to offer materialistically to her husband wow Ruthless is too soft a word for it. What I also wanted to bring to your attention is that you got to remember for a narcissist, children, pets, anybody else who surrounds you, doesn't matter if they're not the overt type, so they're not controlling, anybody else that you share your love and affection with deflects your attention away from them. It detracts from resources that would be available to them otherwise. So they will start resenting your children, your pets. And imagine, especially if they've got other mental illnesses underlying there as well, what they're capable of, hurting innocents because they don't want to share center stage or any of your benefits 
with those dependents. What decent human being would start feeling jealous of your children, your pets, your elderly parents, handicapped people in your family, siblings, or anybody else? The answer to that would be no decent human would feel this way. And let me share another little story about my ex that made me worry. Remember how I told you during one episode that he would go out to expensive dinners with a woman he knew through his ex-girlfriend and whom he flirted with according to his own admissions even from back then? Well, he said, what has she got on offer really? She would always be putting her dogs before you because this lady spends a couple of hours a day taking her pets for a walk. You know what, if a guy doesn't put his kids or his pets or his parents above his good time, above his relationships and meeting women to have a funky time with, then I have no respect for him because what does that say about him? About his decency and consideration. What does that say about his responsibilities and caring for those who are dependent on him? About his compassion and his set of values others before himself right that's what a decent person would do whether they're a man or a woman kids pets elderly parents siblings handicapped dependents whatever dependents come first and his good times or her good time comes secondary to me this points to the fact that this guy finds pet as a competition that are taking away time attention and resources away from him have I really miscalculated him so badly? Have I done him injustice? Is he autistic and he's not aware of feelings or properly wording, putting into words what he feels, what love is? Is he not capable of understanding what others are going through because of some shortcoming in his cognitive process? Maybe, but to me, every single indicator so far point to a person who is very self-absorbed, enjoys takes a kick out of delivering pain to other people and discards them when he's done with them and doesn't really care for them, doesn't have much empathy when they're going through a tough time. I remind everyone that I'm not here with the aim of judging but rather understanding and delivering some kind of therapy to myself so I can get better but also so I can extend some knowledge to those who are going through a similar process as I am going through and I have been through and so that you understand that these people, the narcissists you're involved with, don't care about you no matter how much you wish they did. I don't regret how I felt about this guy. I'm a passionate Mediterranean person. I don't know how to love any less. But I also can't accept a situation where the other individual is telling me they can never love me because both me and other people I think deserved as much to be in a loving, caring relationship. I'm not going to lead a dispassionate life because of somebody else's shortcomings. Where it becomes a blurred line is when you're dealing with a covert narc instead of an overt one because they're not abusive, they won't assault you physically but nevertheless that poison is still there at the roots ready to lash out at you ready to infiltrate your world your mind your being your life and destroy you because these people have got it against the world deep inside they don't care for anyone they don't love anybody no matter what face they're putting on one of compassion one of decency one of the hero who's there for the rescue and remember i met my guy through charitable causes social justice activism but he was there because Obviously, he wanted to show the good face of himself, the fake one, because remember, narcs are always showing fakery to you. Now, I still, until this day, although I'm aware of all the antics he pulled on me, I'm still in denial. I still have a hard time accepting that the person I dealt with, because he is covert and is not physically aggressive or with his words he won't swear he won't demean you the way an overt narc did and i've had an overt narc in my life before so i know the difference you have a hard time swallowing that pill that this person has apathy at their core they don't care for anyone they don't love anybody the only thing they're interested is in furthering themselves in serving themselves validating themselves so even the moments of affection that you share with them it's not about you it's not them enjoying being 
sweet and affectionate toward you. It's about them absorbing the attention you are giving them. They feel good because you're into them, you're attracted to them, you care for them, you desire them, therefore you validate them, you push the worth up. Like I said, I'm still in denial and having a hard time accepting that this is the person I was involved with. And it's going to take me a long time to let it sink in. And I don't know if it ever will, because at the end of the day, I'm living in wishful thinking that he will do something to redeem himself. And the thing is, because he is more gentle, I believe him to be a covert, not an aggressive overt narcissist. For some stupid reason, I've been rationalizing with myself thinking, he's okay, he's decent, I will, I would gaslight myself. Not only would he gaslight me by the things that he would say and the lack of accountability, the lack of compassion and empathy but he would also I would also gaslight myself and because that's what they do they make you feel like it's your fault well I did this because you made me feel like this or it's not my fault you're angry it is your choice to be upset over this I'm not the one who controls your emotions you're out of control with your emotions you should be more you, you know you're unhinged you should be more able to manage them better what the hell so please ladies and gentlemen don't do what i'm doing do as i say not as i do right just please make sure you don't go back to a covert or overt narcissist they will keep doing the same things to you and each time it will get even harder it will get even harder for you to recover because you will be even more emotionally implicated even more confused and even more under the spell of the toxin meaning the poison would have entered your body your mind and you would be of blurred vision more than ever you would be more lost and confused and not knowing which way you're going imagine after all the things that have become apparent to me i'm still kind of hoping that this person will redeem himself in some little way when in fact he has shown that he doesn't care like a meme that i read said if they show you they don't care believe them i'm not here to bag him to run him to the ground or anybody else i still wish the best for him because i really cared for him i felt for him if anything bad was to happen to him it would truly devastate me no doubt about it at the same time i'm aware he didn't care about me at all he wasn't emotionally involved in the slightest he didn't love anybody else because when i would ask him if he would know what love is he would say um i think i know what it is so if they can't even tell you or give you a definition of what love is, they don't feel it. They've never felt it. They will never feel it. They will never know anything about it. Goodness, thank you for sticking around so long. If you did, I hope that you are wiser than me and make smarter choices than I did. Or if you chose poorly as well, I hope that you find the strength within you to move on. Hard achievement to get your hands on, but I know you can do it. Good luck. I'm terribly sorry about the background noise. I started this entry early in the day. I deleted some stuff and re-recorded it because I did sound very flat and boring to listen to speaking. So now it's the end of the day. I'm in a public place. There's a lot of traffic and background noise. Thank you guys. Take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Be true to yourself and don't let anybody take away from that. Don't let anybody destroy the wonderful person you are. Assuming you're a nice person who's listening to me, you know what they say, assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. But sometimes you've got to give it the benefit of the doubt. Learn to read the red flags though. When you see those signs, get out of there quick smart. And please imprint it deep in your mind that narcissists do not love. That's why they won't reach out to you and call you to see what you're up to. They don't miss you. The only time they will try and come back to you or hoover you is when they want something else from you or when they have a lack of attention from other people no matter how many things they did wrong to you and how much they hurt you they will still believe that you betrayed them at the end of a relationship because in their own esteem they won't accept anything they've done wrong they are flawless and please guys give us a thumbs up it takes me a long time to make these things cheers be good everyone talk soon